Am I falling apart already? <laughs> so these, these are some of my axes. You've probably seen them over in the gallery. Um, when we discuss forging an ax for, as a blacksmith, I think of two ways to accomplish the goal. One way, it, the, the logical thing you think of is like a hammer. Take a bar, punch a hole through it, make your eye out of that. And that's the, the big trick to the ax is making that hole. The problem with slitting and drifting is accuracy. And the bigger the ax gets, the bigger that problem becomes. If you are just a degree off on a one inch bar, probably you're not going to have a problem. I was doing axes out of three inch, one inch by three inch bar, and just being a hair off with the chisel, none of them lined up. And there was not a single one of those that I tried to do just eyeball straight through that came out right. So now when I do a punched eye axe, I drill a few holes, I create a path of least resistance, and the punch, then I use a, a flat bottom punch, not a chisel, and that follows through. So I think, yeah, well I do half, half and half, and I do it under the power hammer, which is part of why I'm not going to demonstrate that today, because I, I want to dip, do something that is more obtainable in the home shop, but not everybody has a power hammer. So I, per, you know, for an axe this size, doing a punch die by hand over the anvil isn't that bad. But as soon as you get a little bit bigger, it starts to be problematic. And I think the other method, which we will talk about, and that's why these are done, there's actually a seam, and it starts off looking sort of like this. Now this is two different, two different models of axes on one bar. You can't fold this up and make an axe, but this is wrapped around and welded. You don't have to punch the hole, you forge the hole first and then you build the axe around it, more or less. So this is the, the style we're going to do today, a wrapped axe. Axes, generally, uh, most axes are going to be what you'd call a knife edge. And that's an axe like this, that you can see the, it has a cutting edge that is centered with the eye and everything balances on both sides. The other option is a broad axe style, and the cutting edge is all on one side. And when I, the reason that's important in a hand forged axe is because my cutting, I'm, I'm making these all out of mild steel, and mild steel will not hold an edge. So you have to add something that will hold an edge, and that's a steel bit or a steel cutting edge, and you have to know where to put that. So if you're making a broad axe and you put the steel down the middle, when you sharpen this, you're actually going to end up with mild steel at the cutting edge and not tool steel. So if you're making a broad axe, you've got to think about it and weld the steel to the outside. So we'll pass a couple of these around. Let's see. So this one's a little broad hatchet. The original stock for this was 3 eighths by inch and a half. Um, this hatchet is half by inch and a half, and that's what I'm going to use today. Are you going to explain why they're flat on one side? The broad, yeah. Yeah, the, the broad axe is for a finishing tool. It's sort of like a chisel or a plane to a, a carpenter, and is for squaring up logs, like these flat surfaces in here. These, I mean, these are obviously milled, but historically in Peter's world, Somebody would have been out there with an axe squaring up those logs and making square timbers out of a round log and they would use something more like this. This axe came off the wall, I didn't make this, but you can see a cold shut in this axe here where this axe was wrapped and welded and I, if I look really close I think I can see a little shadow where the tool steel was also welded on. So this is the exact same technique. I have no idea how old this axe is. I don't know when they quit making axes that way. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a historian. I, I think these are historically inspired axes, but I'm not going to call them a replica of anything because I have no, no background. To I haven't studied I'm making this axe from this time period. But it, you know, Peter mentioned the master mirror find. 
uh, this morning, the, the tool chest, the, the Viking era tool chest, you find axes made this way in that chest. I don't know if anybody wants to look at this filthy thing. Uh, the, the little one is a little cleaner, same idea, but if you, look, if you look at it, you can see a little cold shut, so I'm pretty sure this was, that's not a crack, it's a, a, a forge weld, and that's, that's the way that axe was made. So, that's a real brief overview of, of what we want to do. So where do you start? Uh, the logical place seems to be to make the axe head. Unfortunately, the logical place is to buy a handle. Go to, go to the hardware store and decide what you want for a handle. Or if you're going to make a handle, this is less relevant if you want to carve your own handle. Your axe has to fit this. If, it do, if you just make the axe and it doesn't fit, you end up with some great big eye and then you do, really do have to make your, your own handle. Because this was, just, this was just me screwing around and this is what I ended up with and I ended up with an eye that there was no handle I liked except for a full-size felling axe that fit that. So if you want to buy store-bought handles, start by buying the handle. And then you need the tool that sizes the eye, called a drift. This doesn't, isn't a punch, it doesn't make the eye, this just defines your eye size. And you just, these are, I make them out of tool steel. These are, this is an old jackhammer bit. They're really hard to forge, so I'm not going to forge a drift today. Um, but you just make that as close as possible to your axe handle. And these all come from House Handle Company. It's a company in Missouri. They're pretty reliable, pretty affordable, and they have handles for tools I have never heard of. <laughs> so we can pass that around if anybody wants to look at that. In fact, we got, I got a whole pile of drifts here. Uh, that's the one we're going to use today. That's a store-bought drift from somebody that sells cast iron tools and makes hammer drifts and tomahawk drifts. This one came in a pile of rusty junk that somebody in our little town of Beulah found in an old uh, shed they were cleaning out. So that looks like something John would like. So that's just, but that's an axe eye drift. Somebody in Beulah was making axes and, and using that and just, but, you know, just all sorts of different possibilities. So if you find these on the second hand market, they're probably cheap. If somebody's got them at a garage sale, it's a piece of scrap iron. They don't know that it's a tool. At an antique store, they probably don't know what it is either, and you can probably get them pretty cheap if it's an axe size you want to make. I've taken that a little bit further because I, actually, I use a, lot, a power hammer a lot, and I don't want my hands that close if I'm working on the eye under the power hammer. So I made one with a handle on it. <laughs> That's a little bit bigger. I don't know that we'll get around to using that. Um, but the, so start with a the handle, then make a drift. And like I say, we have to have a tool steel edge. So that's my next step. And the reason I do the tool steel first is because eventually I want to pick it up and set it in the ax. And I'd rather be able to pick it up with my hands and drop it in there than try and fiddle with the little tool steel piece by hand. So that just lets this cool while I make the rest of the axe. I'll pass this around. This has some little sharp points on it, and I'll explain that as we get to it. So try not to make yourself bleed. Sean, I have a question about the drifts. Should they be fairly refined? Like, smooth and yes. As well formed as you can make them? Yes. Yeah, if they get bunged up, you can get them stuck in the, the axe head. Um, ideally not. And they should taper. They don't need to taper so much in this dimension from the, the long way, but the short way they should taper so that you drive half from one side, half from the other, and you get an hourglass shaped hole, and that makes your handle stronger. But the same, same principle applies if you're making hammers or any other tool with an eye. So we're going to make a drift. I bought a really nice brand new piece of W1 to make, or not drifts, uh, make the little cutting steel out of and I left it at home. So we're going to use a piece of FOP, means found on pile. I have no idea what it, what it is. I gave it a little quick test the other day and it hardens pretty nice in oil. 
So it's some kind of oil hardening tool steel. I, anybody knows what these old hand drills were made out of? Probably lots of different things, but. What's that? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 10, 1085, 1095, something like that, I don't know. But it will work. Uh, I kind of like leaf springs. When I'm working at home, it's, it's fairly decent steel for making the, the bits out of. Where you get your old one at? My what? You said you used old one, old one tool steel? Um, when I buy tool steel, I'm kind of lazy. And McMaster Car has a lot of stuff, and I just ordered from McMaster Car. It is probably not the cheapest place to buy steel. There's probably other, a lot of other places, but they've got a good variety of sizes, good variety of materials, and for some reason they ship everything FedEx overnight, even though they bill me for UPS ground, and I just keep going to them. <laughs> This is uh, sort of a take on Paul's little forging contest last night that uh, I had to start with a round bar, but I need a little wedge-shaped piece. So we've got to, because we don't have any rectangular tool steel out there, I've got to reforge this. And I, I've already reforged it to a rectangle to save time. And then we're going to forge it into a, uh, a taper, sort of like Peter did for his... Uh, lock sides. Yeah, a little hotter. Essentially what you're doing is making a scarf that's going to be down inside the axe. For those that understand scarfs and forge welding, just a, a thin spot that's going to blend a little bit easier. If you just stuff a square piece of steel in there, you're going to end up with a little step and you're never going to hide it and you're never going to get rid of it. So well, I'm just going to start by peening. just make a wedge out of that. And we want the wedge to be, it's, this is sort of a personal preference thing. I have seen people who take the ax all the way out to this shape, thin this and put the steel in. I prefer to leave it a little bulkier so that it has less surface area to bring up to welding heat, plus it's thicker and will hold heat. My rule of thumb, and it comes from nowhere, I don't know if it's a real rule of thumb or if just what I prefer, is that the cutting edge is at least as thick as the material is when you make the weld. So if you are welding up two half inch pieces, the welding, the tool steel would be half inch thick. If you take it, if you only have a piece of quarter inch steel, draw this out so it's at least a quarter inch so that you don't end up with some little paper thin piece of steel in the middle. Although really you only need a few thousandths of an inch to hold an edge. But, oh yeah, it's getting good. So I don't know why I ever decided on that, but it seems to be that it works. Plus it adds a little bit more mass to the, the edge and gives you a little more material to spread. I should have back bent that just like Peter did his piece, but I didn't. And that's really all I need to do to that. that. It doesn't need to be super pretty because it's going to be welded in and reforged and ground and 
trimmed and all sorts of stuff done to it. But it has a problem. If you put that in the axe and smack it, it's like a watermelon seed between your fingers. And it doesn't stay put, especially with some flux. And somebody over here is going to be wearing it if we do that. So that's why this one's got all these little pointy teeth on it. Hopefully if you make it, put some burrs on there and then close up the weld joint before you try to weld it, those dig in and then your, your steel stays put in the ax instead of squirting across the room or you have to go find it again. And there's two ways to do that. I'm going to straighten this out first. That's a little bit on the crooked side. You want to hold it? Yeah, let's see, like that. Well, one way we can do this is with a square ended chisel, kind of like an engraving tool. And I can come in from the side. And I can raise a burr there. The only reason I don't like this is if I turn it over and do it on the other side so I've got burrs on both sides, I flatten these out. I've done it in a wooden block, but you get so much flame and smoke when you set that in a wooden block, it's really hard to see what you're doing. So we're going to go to the next method. Let's get it hot again. And we're going to put, put the burrs just on the edge. Let's see, which vise would you rather me use? Your choice. You'd rather use this one? This okay. Yeah. We'll use that vise. It doesn't need to be a very hot for that. Yeah. So hopefully everybody can see this on the, the camera. All I'm going to do is put the chisel in and, it, and it's at an angle. And that's just going to roll a burr, a little sawtooth right off the edge. And then I'm going to come back, do the same thing from the other side, and hopefully get opposing teeth here. There we go. So I end up with just, just what I passed around there. I've got teeth pointing both directions that are going to dig into my, my main axe body. And then I'm going to cut this off and ignore it. It's just going to sit on the side of the forge and cool off while we do the axe. If you don't do that first and you're ready to weld the axe and you're all excited, you tend to get in a hurry and you don't take the time to put the burrs on it. And then you've got to chase it around the room. And Um, so far as I know, like I say, I, I don't have the historical background to have, have researched exactly how this is done. This is my take on historically styled axes. Um, I suspect there may have been other ways that they did that, and Peter might be able to answer that, although he told me the other day he didn't make very many axes, which really surprised me. And I will admit, the first time I ever saw an axe done this way, I was watching the Woodwright Show, and some of you may or may not be familiar with Roy and the Woodwright Show, but he was visiting Colonial Williamsburg, and Peter was part of the process. He wasn't, wasn't the smith forging the axe, and I forgot his name again already. Richard, Richard, Guthrie was the smith, Richard Guthrie was the smith forging the axe, and Peter was striking for him. But it's very much the same, same process. Perfect. Where did I put my hammer? No. <laughs> we'll figure this out. So this is just a little do-ahead step, so we've got it. And the 
let's not lose it. Okay, so that's that's the cutting edge, that's the steel, that's the, the part that's going to do all of the work when the axe is finished. In the long run, it's the most important thing you're going to, going to do to it. So now, as far as the axe body, again, this is sort of what you're looking for, and this is two different axes, I think, think I mentioned that. This is just to give an idea of different ways you can start with the same material, start with the same process, and end up with more than one end result. But we're going to fuller in on opposite sides, one for the pole of the axe, which is the flat section here. This is the pole. And the other is going to form the inside of the eye. So they have to be on opposite faces of the axe when they're forged to bend up properly. So we can pass this around, and I'm going to pass, in fact, I'm going to pass quite a few around. Um, this is my master. I just keep this. I, this is what I transfer my marks off of. Um, I really like Peter's philosophy of just do it by eye, but if I do this by eye, I end up with some really wonky looking axes. So I have, this is measured out. My dimensions are all stamped on here if you want to write them down. There's nothing sacred about them. There's nothing special about them. It's what works for me with the drift I'm using for the handle I like. Um, if you take these measurements and you don't forge it as much as I do, it's going to fit a smaller handle. If you forge it a little more, it's going to fit a bigger handle. So play with it. Make it bigger. Use wider stock if you want a bigger axe. Narrower stock if you want a narrower axe. Um, this thing is the same process. It's actually a smaller bar. This was an inch and a quarter bar that I did an upset square bend the hard way before I did the forge weld. And that's how I got the beard on the axe, was by bending this bar down to make a, an L-shaped piece. Probably not the easiest way to do it, but it worked. So once I have that, I need to be able to find it in the fire. So I can pass the patter pattern around. It's just center punch so I can find that when it gets hot. Um, let's put the axe blank in there. Yeah. As long as I'm yakking, we might as well be getting something hot. And once I've done the center punches, I like to uh, fuller it so I can find it when I come back to the anvil. Because we're going to do most of this with the cross peen, and that, that point has to stay off the edge of the anvil, or you're going to either mess up the pole or the eye, depending on which way you're working. So I like the little fuller mark because I can feel that. If you're really good aim and can hold that steady and it's not going to move, you really don't have to do that. You just turn your center punch marks up so that you can see them and line them up at the edge of the anvil. And just do half face blows and you can do it that way. It's sort of up to your skill level. I like the fullers because it, it gives me a more reliable result. And some of this, your notes have been taken for you. This is not from me, but if you get the hammers blow, in the last issue, uh, Gerald Boggs, yes, Gerald Boggs has an article on making an ax. It is remarkably similar to exactly what I do. And there are a few things that he talks about in here that I'll tell you that um, when I get to that point that I'm changing the way I do it because I liked his method better. <laughs> uh, so if you've got this, it has just almost everything I'm talking about in an excellent form with pictures from Mark Asprey. And it's really a, a very good article. And, his stock size is almost exactly the same stock size, and his axe handles are about the same, and we're getting close. Yeah, let's go ahead and... Ready? Okay. 
okay? Yeah, that's good. Okay, that's enough. We'll turn it around and get the other side hot. Try not to make those fullers too deep if you do that. If you make them too deep, sometimes you can't quite erase them when you forge the edges of the eye. Um, I call these ears. Um, langettes, I think, are another term. I've heard them called lugs. Uh, I don't know that they serve a hugely practical purpose other than I think they look really cool. They probably help hold your handle on because it adds more surface area between the handle and the axe. But you'll notice no modern axe comes this way anymore because it takes too much effort probably for a modern factory to put those on. But I like them, so I do them. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask, because I'll forget something. Oh, I'm just moving it up in the fire and looking. Again, at home, I uh, tend to use a power hammer. Um, I like doing the handwork, but I'm trying to uh, get to the point that I'm a little bit more profitable in the shop, and that means I need to do things a little bit more efficiently sometimes. So this step I do with a piece of quarter inch round bar under the power hammer and when the quarter inch round bar bottoms out and the power hammer is hitting the flat stock that's as deep as I need to go with this fuller mark and I can do the whole axe in one heat and I'm on to some, or not the whole axe but all the fullering in one heat. Quarter inch bar on half stock. Yeah, so I'm ending up with a quarter inch deep mark. That's good. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. That'll work. So we have pretty much just like the piece passed around. We're going to heat the eye area up. And I like to shape both eyes and get them pretty much done before I go on to, to do anything else. I don't, there's a certain logic to, to work this eye and this in the end, if you're going to spread the end, it's probably more efficient. But I like to make sure my eyes match before I do anything else or sometimes they don't match. Oh, I bet it's not hot enough yet. I don't know. Yeah. Oh good, that was your phone. I was gonna say I didn't think I brought my phone in here with me. Just short of a welding heat. What's that? Um, well, like I say, you don't absolutely have to fuller it. There are lots of ways you can hold something on the anvil. Um, so you can hold a fuller in your hand and, and strike for yourself. Various anvil hold fast. You could use, leave it attached to a longer bar and pinch it between your legs. Uh, Striker makes it a lot easier, plus it makes a better demo. Are we hot? Okay. So I'm going to hook that eye right next to the pole on the edge of the anvil so I can find it and kind of set that eye down. Now the other mark that we can't mess up is here. 
So don't get wild with your hammer and start flattening up here. You're going to end up the edge of that eye. Now I go to the cross pin. And try and work in the middle to start with and then out to each edge. And you can see it starts spreading. By hand that usually takes a few heats. And I try to do all my peening from the inside of the axe. So if I don't smooth those peen marks out later, they're on the inside of the eye, not the outside. And I also theorize that leaving a few peen marks in the eye helps the handle stay on better. I like it, yeah. I can rationalize anything. So somebody had asked me about this axe earlier. I brought this just to show, show my starting point. This is uh, probably the first punched eye axe I ever made. I made a few wrapped eye tomahawk style uh, trade axes. Tomahawk's really a bad term for them. Um, but this is the first one I ever punched. I probably did this over 20 years ago. The eye is way too thin on this side, so it was filled with an arc welder to build it back up again. And I have used, split mountains of kindling wood with this. It's the one I used to take to the rendezvous when we went to the rendezvous that I used in the, the throwing axe competitions. And it's still a functional, it's ugly, but it is still a functional axe. So even if your first axe isn't a thing of beauty, that doesn't mean it's a bad axe. It just means you might not want to put it up for sale somewhere. <laughs> Oh, that's perfect. That's not perfect. Ugh. So we just finished peening this out now. I'm going to kind of blend that fuller mark. You got to go over the far edge and hook that fuller over. So there we have that offset to both sides. And we are starting to define the ears. I do see some axes with round ears. You could leave it like that. I don't like round ears. I like them pointy. So I'm going to do just a little bit on the ears, turn it around, draw out the other side, and then I'll dress both sets of ears so they look the same. I don't know if that's hot enough yet. Yeah, probably okay for this. So for this, you just stand it up on the end, edge of the anvil and work both sides. And you can work it on this side. Yep, it's all purified. We got a pair of pickup tongs. That's hard to pick up off of this floor. Stay, stay. Okay. Thank you. So that starts sort of putting a point on there. We're gonna do more, but I'm gonna turn it around. I say if I work both eyes, then I have a better visual sense of whether or not they're the same. And if I put the points on this, then maybe I don't draw the other one out the same before I point it. Okay. 
I kind of mentioned that uh, the first place I saw an axe like this done was on the Woodwright shop. If you go, go back in my uh, incentive to, be, to become a blacksmith, that's actually kind of where it goes back to. I was, I never thought I wanted to be a blacksmith. But I saw this show on TV once called The Woodwright Shop, and he was doing this really interesting woodworking where he took a, took a log and he started splitting it up, and then he started hitting it with an axe, and after a while he's got some piece of furniture or something sort of, sort of interesting. And I said, wow, that's pretty cool. And I bought his book and thought, yeah, that's pretty cool. And, and then I started looking for old tools, froes and axes and adzes and planes and... In the 80s, those were really hard to find. None of the antique stores in my area had them. eBay wasn't out there. You couldn't shop online. But there was this chapter in his book about blacksmithing. And I thought, I took metal shop in high school. They had a forge and an anvil. I made a cold chisel. I can do this. And I went to the library, and I bought a bunch of books. And next thing you know, I'm collecting blacksmithing tools, because I was lucky enough to find those in our area, even though I couldn't find woodworking tools. So now for about 30 years, I have been more of a blacksmith. I still hardly ever do any woodworking. I'm still interested. I still like the idea of traditional woodworking. But I set out to make woodworking tools, and it's just in the last few years that I'm actually making woodworking tools finally. It was not as easy as it looked. <laughs> So that's kind of what gave me my uh, kick in the pants to learn blacksmithing. So same, same process on the other side. So that starts to look more like uh, what we're after. Some people refer to these as bow tie axes because before you fold it up, they sort of look like a bow tie. If you, you sort of study uh, you know, study may be the right word, hunt around for information on axes. You can find all sorts of really interesting axes that are nothing more than a forge welding project. The, the eye is one or two pieces because they're, they're long eyes and they weld a piece on here, then you weld another piece for the blade, and then you weld another piece for the cutting edge. And These axes that look impossible to make even this, I can't imagine. I used to think, how do you punch that? How do you do that? Well, if you, if you wrap them, that's not that hard other than it's a whole lot of steel. But conceptually, it's no different. And you see the German goosewing axes. They really look like they are not that hard to do other than it's a lot of forge welding and you gotta get the forge welds right. So hopefully I'll learn how to do that in another year or two. Oh yeah. That's about where that other eye was, and I've got enough heat left, I'm going to start evening that up a little bit. So those are getting to be pretty darn close. Oh, 
I'm just, I'm just looking. Even though you're tending fire, I can't resist coming over here and playing with it. You know? I also tend to do these in a gas forge just because I can get an even heat and get the whole thing up to welding heat at one time and seems a little easier or a little, little more reliable. I like working in coal because it's more fun. But, uh, but I can work two of these back and forth while one's heating. I can work on the other one when I'm at home. Now here's where I'm going to go back to the hammer's blow article. I've always just done these here at the anvil. He works them over the horn with a farrier's rounding hammer. And I think it makes a more graceful ear on the axe to do it that way. But that gives you just a little bit of a rounded ear. It's just a little concave. And I think that just adds a little bit more grace to the axe. It's kind of hard to see. And I'll admit that I'm going to clean that up on the grinder anyways. Uh, we could spend all day filing it. I am more of a fan of filing all the time, but not for something this big. Lately I've been making a lot of hinges, lots and lots of hinges. And I keep thinking, now how's an easier way to do this? You know, you gotta, gotta cut the eye out, you gotta make one leaf of the hinge fit the other leaf of the hinge. And I have finally realized that the easiest way to do it is just to get your hacksaw and your files and your chisels. Trying to figure out ways to jig that up and cut it ahead of time and the thought of, well, I could buy a milling machine for $5,000 and spend 20 minutes setting it up, or I could just cut it. And it's way easier to just cut it. Don't be afraid of hacksaws and files. And we were in here the other day working on the sundial, and somebody, sorry, I'm going to sell you out here, uh, says, how do you use this bandsaw? So I handed him a hacksaw, and that's how we cut it. <laughs> By the way, Matt, you could use new blades in your hacksaw. They're kind of dull. Anvil's a little jumpy. It, uh, if you can keep your anvil tied down, you'll be a lot happier. So that's really all you need to do to those eyes to get the ears on them. If you want bigger ears, you can draw it out and make it a little bit thinner. The key at this point is that they're the same. And I found this really neat pair of wing dividers laying around. I do a lot of these and just figure I did the same thing to both sides. They must be the same. That's not always true. So if you can uh, check one side. And check the other side. Yeah, this side needs to draw out just a hair more. If you fold that up and it's crooked, you can sort of fix it, kind of, but it's probably easier to fix it now. I'll admit I made a tool for that that I can put in the vise. And I can hang the axe over it to square up that pole, but it's not, it's easier to do it now. <laughs> That's my drift gun. Yeah. Yep. 
I'm leaving stuff all over the place here. Ooh, there's a breeze. That would be hotter. Where's the uh, piece that has two axes in one? Okay. Okay, so this one's only got one ear. That's uh, this axe. And actually, I like this. I like the straighter top. I don't know why. To try and forge this this way means that you have to thin this eye in the other direction, and that makes the axe head curl over. I forge the ears exactly the same way to get this, and I cut it off. There may be another way to do that. I've never been able to peen anything all to one side. It's probably possible, but I've never pulled it off myself. So I think it's easier to just take a hot cut and cut that extra ear off. It's not too hard to forge most of the blade to one side because then you can set it on the anvil and straighten it. But Peter and I will have a talk later. He'll probably tell me, you know, that's really easy to do. Yeah. <laughs> All you got to do is get a left-handed widget. So we're just going to work this a little bit and thin it out a little more and try and make this side the same as the other side. Also keep in mind that this side's hotter. It's going to shrink just a little bit. I don't know that that's a big deal in this scale, but I've had it bite me before. So you can look and see. I think that's still a hair smaller than the other side is. So we're going to This is like uh, fixing a table leg that's a little bit too short. You cut one off and then the other one's a little too long and you cut the other one off and that's better. So you can see that, that looks, hopefully you can see that on the camera, but those eyes are now about the same. Now while I don't like to thin this all the way out at this stage, I want to thin it out a little bit just to give myself a head start and because my cutting edge is probably a little less than a half. But I like all that extra meat for the forge weld. And we may have to, may have to check for clinkers and make sure that's a good clean fire before we get to the weld part. So here's the uh, cutting edge we just did. It's still a little hot. We can pass that around. I'll need that in a couple of minutes. <coughs> See, I got the after lunch sleepy period. bring half the fire over there with me. Now I'm just going to peen this out yeah, so it's about 3 8 thick. Nothing magical here. That's just kind of an arbitrary thing because it seemed like it made my life easier at some point so I still do it. Now it's a little bit too big for that pair of tongs, so we'll grab it with that pair of tongs. Let's 
excuse me. I think there's a sneeze in there. You guys are awfully quiet. I don't think it's ready yet. I'm just gonna put those on there. Seems respectful on this side, just quiet on your side. Okay. <laughs> I bet it was on in the floor. It's just a, it's just a spare. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't holding the horn on. I hope. <laughs> yeah. And certainly we can pass any more of these around if you haven't seen them in the gallery. There's one here that. That's it. That's good. Got to stay over there. Yeah. What's that? Um, I refer to it as a bearded axe. Somebody that's more knowledgeable might say, oh no, a bearded axe has some other characteristic. But for my money, that's a bearded axe. Um, there are lots of different. I, if you scrounge around looking for axe patterns, there are, and I meant to print them out, but my computer was down before we came. There are dozens and dozens, there are sheets that just different profiles of axes with their, their nomenclature of this is a Missouri axe and this is a Kentucky axe and this is an East Alaskan axe, you know, and just lots and lots of different variety in axe shapes. And if you look, even on eBay, and find people are starting to sell European antiques, and you find all these Hungarian and Russian and stuff axes that are just more shapes than you can imagine. Okay, so now those pretty much match. The next trick is to fold this up, and it's kind of an unruly fold job. We want pretty much the heat right in the center of the eye if we can. You end up with a whole lot more material hot than you need to. So you got to work at it a little bit to close it up. And the real key here is that the shoulders on the inside of the eye line up. If those don't line up, the only way to fix it is to file the, the one that's fat later. If this thing is a little out of position, it's easier to, to fix. Now, ideally, you've made it perf perfectly symmetrical, and it folds up perfectly. Look at, the, look at the filth. I can sign my name in the table. What? I'm trying not to. I got to get in there. Ooh. There's an axe in there somewhere. I saw it. So yeah, I was just hoping it was hot. So for those of you who don't know me, um, Currently, I'm a firefighter for the city of Aurora. I work about 20 hours a week in the blacksmith shop and have thought I was running a business for about 20 years. And only in the last few years have I realized, oh, this is what it's like to actually make a little bit of money. So I'm actually making some income now in the blacksmith shop and thinking of retiring from the fire department and hoping to supplement my pension enough making things like axes and hinges. So. Yeah, I'm hoping it's not starving. 
I'm hoping my customers uh, would gla gladly uh, buy more things if I told them, yes, I can do that in a week instead of three to four weeks. It's still not hot. But this is the kind of work I prefer to do. I've never been into railings and staircases and window grills and gates and things like that. Just don't really, I like to look at them. I really appreciate the work that goes into them, but I don't have the ambition to build a spiral staircase that takes two years to put together. <laughs> That's better. Yeah, not a lot better. It's a little better. Now, if you're using uh, box jaw tongs like this, put the box on the outside of the axe while you do this. It'll be easier to get off later. Now well, let's see if we can just get the eye part hard, hot. Um, I use both. If I'm doing things that require smaller forge welds, I really prefer the coal forge because you can get so much better control on the heat. For axes, I like the gas forge because I can bring a nearly finished axle back up to welding heat if I very easily and get the whole thing at an even heat. And I can also work on two axes at once and not worry about burning them up. You know, so right, right now I would be forging the alternate axe and being a little bit more efficient. But if I do that in the coal forge, I always burn up the other piece. But you wouldn't have time to tell us about it. What? You wouldn't have time to tell right. us about it. I have a Sandia forge. Yeah. Yeah, we're 6,500 feet, so I have to run the thing at about 22 pounds of pressure and eats the gas pretty fast, but it, it definitely welds and I never burn anything up in it. So it's, it's pretty nice. Twenty-two is what I run it at to weld. I don't run it at that day in and day out. Okay. So now we have to get that pair of tongs back out of there before we get them stuck. One of the best ways to hold these is with hoop tongs. And that gives you a pretty good, secure way to hold that while you do the rest of this. The hardest part of holding the axe is when you're drifting the eye after you finish the blade because it's tapered and it's sort of hard to hold on to. So I'll try not to drop it in anybody's lap. You could probably hold these with uh, hammer eye tongs. And these uh, kind of curved pickup tongs aren't bad. Those, those actually don't, they're a little floppy, but it's not going to, going to fall out of them. Yeah, we get a little hotter. Now what I'm going to do first is I'm going to bring the, the heel of this together and I want to weld the heel initially before I put the edge in. If you put the edge in before doing the heel, it tends to leave the heel open and then it's kind of hard to get that heel a good weld. I really like a good weld right there. I don't want to see a cold shut there. 
It probably doesn't hurt anything if there's a little one, but it makes me nervous. I'm always afraid I'm going to split it open. Uh, so the better a weld I can get there, the, the happier I am. Are we hot yet? So now I'm just trying to even up the two sides of the eye and get this as close to the same as I can. Invariably, there's always some difference between the front of the axe or the one side and the other in spite of my best efforts. And I'll do some uh, grinding and trimming and fiddling and fussing and all that other stuff. So we need to get that ready for welding. I tend to just use borax for flux. Uh, it really melts and flows down in there very well. And I probably tend to overflux, which is a bad habit of mine because it really doesn't do you any good if you do, but I'm always paranoid that there's going to be a cold shutdown in there and if I can get some flux in there to liquefy all the scale then maybe I can get all the crap out of there. Okay, let's not burn it. Um, it's whatever Matt had. I don't know. Is Matt here? Uh, I'm assuming this is 20 mule team borax from the grocery store. I have bought anhydrous borax, but it, yep, there you go. There's the commercial. <laughs> Um, but I think uh, unless you put your anhydrous borax in an airtight container and open it up and use it really fast, it's only anhydrous for the first day. <laughs> and so you might as well use regular borax. I'm, I'm laying it in flat uh, because I feel like I have less chance of a, an ear being low in the fire and burning it off. Um, if you stand it on edge, you have the advantage that some of that flux might bring some of the scale out and flow out. Um, but you also have a chance when you do the steel, if it's not in there really solid, that when you pull your axe out, the steel won't be there anymore. <laughs> so it's, it's just the way I, I do it. I don't know if it's... It's certainly not the only way, and there's an argument for either, either direction, but I think you've got to keep it moving in the fire, or only one side of it gets hot, and then it doesn't weld. I tried using 01 for the tool steel part, and maybe I just had a bad day, but I was burning the 01 out of it before the mild steel got hot enough to weld. And so I don't know if 01 just burns at a really low temperature, or if I was just having a bad day in the forge, but after a couple axes I pulled it out and there was just a little, you know, well, the whole steel fell out, just about half of it burned out. And I never even saw any sparks coming out of the fire. So I don't know what, what the deal was with that, so I quit using a one. Yeah. Having this stuff under there. Yeah, it's getting close. Now, as far as uh, forge welding and sparks, uh, a lot of people say, oh, look for the sparks. If you see sparks, you went too far. Um, I like to look that the metal is the same color as the coke bed that it's laying in, if you've got a good hot fire, and that's plenty hot enough. If it starts sparking, you've gone too far, and if the steel, when you're doing the edge, is sparking, you've probably burned a lot of the carbon out of your steel, and you're not going to get as good a, a product. Oh, you don't have to shut that off. I'm just looking to see, see where we're at fire-wise. Good clean fire. This anvil's a little further away from the forge than I would like. No, I'm, I'll still do it over here. Uh, my anvil's right here. 
so I only have to go this far. Yeah, I'm gonna leave that eye exposed so I can grab it. We are getting close, I think. These are also really good knuckle burners. Uh, there's a lot of radiant heat coming off of this axe, and if I get tired of it, I'll put a glove on. <laughs> the, the only prob problem with a glove is oftentimes that's where the scale goes, is right down the open cuff of the glove, and that's even worse. Yeah, keep, keep, keep the blower on. One more flip, and I think we'll be there. This fire produces so much ash. Oh, it does, yeah. So I just don't want to spray it in your face. <laughs> yeah. So I'll be welding. It's open on the end, which means, and I'm starting at my end, so the flux and the crud's going that away for those of you wearing shorts in the front row. <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> no. No, I just don't want you to blame me for not warning you. Okay, let's see if that's hot enough. Okay. I believe that's, a, that's welded, and that's all I'm trying to do right now is just get that heel stuck so that when I put the cutting edge in, which we're going to do next, you don't have to bring that up to heat, I just want to set it somewhere. And I make my tongs out of mild steel so I can do this. Did the cutting edge come back? Nope, there it is. I thought that was a drift. Sometimes this is the most problematic part of the, uh, the entire axe is getting this in there so you like it. But I leave the cutting edge a little bit big so that it's guaranteed to weld in there and I'm going to trim it off after we're through welding. Now another reason for uh, having that cutting edge cool and not making it when you need it is they, they weld at different temperatures. We just need to get that hot enough to flux. Tool steel welds. Okay, perfect. Tool steel welds at a uh, lower temperature than the mild steel does. So if you, had, if you made the ax then set it aside, made the tool steel, and stuck them together, you're more likely to overheat the tool steel, theoretically. I don't know if it's easier on this side of an axe, or this style, because I'm 100% enclosed right now. You know, right now this, this looks like this. So the odds of me burning the tool steel out before the mild steel is hot enough to weld is slim. It'd be much easier if you're welding it all to one side. You do that, leave the tool steel up in the fire so that it heats a little more slowly than the mild steel. That's also tougher because there's no way to wedge that in there and make it stay. Um, I would probably cheat and tack it, weld it on there. What's that? What does the start joint, what degrees is that about? Having the slightest idea. Oh, okay. I, uh, I just, if you're doing that, you just need to make sure that you come to a point here and come to a point here okay. so that they blend. Okay. Um, there's probably something mathematical that would be the easiest to forge. I'm not the guy. <laughs> What? Why not just do it like the other axe? Right away? 
and, and because you would end up with mild steel, when you push all that over and forge that bevel, you would end up with mild steel on the outside. And a chisel edge axe has to have the steel on the outside of the, of the cutting edge because it's, because this is, this is, you know, if you did this, by the time you forge that bevel, you're going to end up with mild steel as your, your leading edge. What if you ground it away? Yeah, you probably could. I'm, I'm sure it's possible, but I, I don't think that traditionally it was done that way. I've never seen anything that implies that you would do that. And the old chisels and axes that I've seen that have, you can tell they were forge welded. There's a scarf. The, the reason you know it was welded is because you can see the scarf line on the, the edge there. So we just need to flux this. I think I'll bring the flux over there because it'll be a little easier. So it sounds like we're going to uh, weld this and then we need to take a brief break while they change tapes and that's a good chance for everybody to stretch and find a bathroom and then we'll, we'll go as far as we can with this one and if we have to, we'll switch to an axe that's further along. Do you, uh, do you ever put the flux in when you put the piece in as well or just do it when it's hot? Um, I just do it when it's hot. Um, I think there's really valid arguments for doing it in the fire. I've just never gotten in that habit. Um, as soon as you bring it out of the fire, it starts to scale. So if you can do it in the fire, you're going to eliminate some of that scale. Bring them up good and slow or you won't have an even even heat. It's a lot of a lot of steel to to heat up. And you know this seems like a lot of work, but even the punched eye axes, um, these are still a tool steel cutting edge and a mild steel bar. So instead of doing all this prep to wrap the eye, you're spending your time with a chisel cutting that slot. Instead of wrapping it up and having a slot to set that tool steel in, you have to chisel a slot to drop the tool steel in. And that, that's a fair amount, you know, you've got to get it about an inch deep or inch and a quarter deep or so to, to be able to get that in. And that's a fair amount of chiseling. And it's really kind of hard to hold on to an ax while you chisel it. But all you can do is lock it in the vise and it slips and slides and Yeah, we're getting real close. Sir. When you need your bearded axe, do you have to slip? No, the, the bearded axe is uh, no, it's it's folded, but it's a piece of inch and a quarter half by inch and a quarter that has a 90 degree upset corner the hard, the hard way okay. before I folded it. Gotcha. And again, it probably would have been easier to start with a wider piece of material and thin the middle out than it was to do a 90 degree upset corner of the long dimension. Is there? Okay. Okay. Oh, Paul's gone. We're okay. And while I have a uh, welding heat and it's hot, uh, I'll explain this hammer in a minute. I'm going to start spreading that just because it's convenient to do so.
And I think we actually overheated the steel a little bit there. You can see that's uh, crumbling. I'm not going to pick it up, but you can see on this we're, we're crumbling the edge. I'm hoping what is trapped between the mild steel is in better shape than that. That's part of the problem with using an unknown steel that you've never worked with. So we're just going to set this on the fire, take our break, and see you in about 10 minutes.